I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 7 this evening. And I'll remind you of a song or a little ditty that you learned as a kid. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words set great forests on fire, destroy relationships, tear down characters, split churches, break up mission teams, discredit the gospel, and send people to hell. Is that how you learned that one? Words can be powerful. Harmful words, slanderous words, are the backdrop of Psalm 7. They are the situation from which David writes a song to be placed in the songbook of Israel for all of us to have our eyes on and our hearts involved in and then to put on our lips in song. Let's read together Psalm 7. A Shigayon of David, which he sang to Yahweh concerning the words of Cush, the Benjamite. O Yahweh, my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. O Yahweh, my God, if I have done this, If there is injustice in my hands, if I have rewarded evil to him who is at peace with me, or have plundered my adversary without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it, and let him trample my life down to the ground and cause my glory to dwell in the dust. Selah. Arise, O Yahweh, in your anger. Lift up yourself against the fury of my adversaries. Arouse yourself for me. You have appointed judgment. Let the congregation of the peoples encompass you and over them return on high. Yahweh judges the peoples. Give justice to me, O Yahweh, according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and prepared it. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, he travails with wickedness. He conceives mischief and gives birth to falsehood. He has dug a pit and hollowed it out. He has fallen into the hole which he made. His mischief will return upon his own head, and his violence will descend upon his own skull. I will give thanks to Yahweh according to his righteousness, and will sing praise to the name of Yahweh Most High. This is a psalm I would not have picked to preach. And as we make our way through the Psalms in their canonical order, as we find themselves in our Bible, we find ourselves in Psalm 7 together tonight. This is the Word of God through David. And it begins with the ascription at the top. You, th- those words we have, uh, Shigayon of David, when he sang to Yahweh concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. Those are not editorial editions. Those are in the original text. And so we need to understand what these mean. And frankly, it's hard to understand what a shigayon is. (laughs) It is why you have the the Hebrew word right there in your English translations. It only occurs twice in the Bible. The other one is in Habakkuk 3. And, And its derivation is uncertain. It either comes from a word that means to wander around, to reel back and forth, or another word that means to go mad. And so... It probably has something to do with that first word, wandering around, reeling back and forth. It probably has something to do with variations, for there are a variety of themes in this psalm, all smashed together. And calling it a shigayon, or a conglomeration of various ideas, is a recognition that the ideas in this song are all over the place. We will see a flow, a continuity in the song, But the song is somewhat lifelike. If you think about life as a tapestry, and you and I are sort of underneath the tapestry looking up at it, while God is above the tapestry as a master weaver, 
creating a grand picture of life. We look at the tapestry from the underside and we see different colors of threads going all kinds of different directions. We don't see the pattern. God on the other side of the tapestry, of course, is weaving the master plan of redemptive history involving every single one of our lives. And it is ordered and sensical. It's a grand picture that he is putting together. We don't have all the pieces. We don't have all of the knowledge. We, we look up and we see what look like to us random threads. And so what is required as we look up at the tapestry is faith. And it is the faith that recognizes that things are not right here. And, and so many of the Psalms are this way. They are a recognition of the tension of life in a broken world. Life as a sinner and living under the consequences of our own sins and other people's sins and asking for help. And the result is that we wait in faith for God's help. Martin Luther said, David made psalms. We also will make psalms and we will sing them as well as we can to the honor of the Lord and to spite and mock the devil. Luther and David and we in our singing express the tension of life in a broken world. We express the faith that God is orchestrating something that we can't see the big picture. We're underneath and we see the bits and the pieces. The ascription at the top gives us the historical situation. This is a song which David sang to Yahweh concerning the words of Cush or concerning the matter related to Cush, a Benjamite. And, and we really have no idea who Cush is other than he is a, an Israelite in the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was Saul's tribe. David's relationship to the tribe of Benjamin was touchy at best. Saul was David's predecessor. Saul was king over the land, and yet early on in Saul's reign, David was told that he would be king. The lineage of the royal line would not come down through Saul. It would jump out of Saul's line because of Saul's disobedience to the Lord. And the lineage of the royal line would find its way, as God had already promised, to the tribe of Judah and through a man who had a heart after God's. And as you can imagine, a, a king who depended on his uh, reputation being passed on through his own lineage would not take that very kindly. And though David was Saul's son-in-law, David was hunted by Saul throughout his life. And we know that both before David was king and also during Absalom's rebellion, that members of the tribe of Benjamin held it against David that Saul's line was not going to be the royal line. So the backdrop of this psalm is either 1 Samuel 24 to 26, those three chapters detailing the relationships between David and Saul before David was king, or not quite as likely, but perhaps 2 Samuel 16 through 20 during Absalom's rebellion when Benjamites who were offended at Saul no longer being king took it out against David. I think the, the earlier context is more likely. David, behind the scenes, has apparently been slandered for things he has not done. And so he pens a song to the Lord in five parts. There is a petition for help, an oath of innocence, a request for justice, a profession of faith, and an expression of thanks. And the profession of faith occurs in verse 10. Look down there real quick. He is... Asking for things, he is making declarations about his innocence, and then he's calling out for God's justice. But in verse 10, he says, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. There is a declaration of theological truth that marks the turn in the psalm. And from that point forward, David ascribes things that are true about God, and then he sings with praise and thanksgiving. And we're learning as we study the Psalms to look for that turn. Uh, the turn is so prevalent in so many of the songs. There is a problem and we're looking for a solution to the problem. And the psalmist feels the problem and sings about the problem. And we enter into the emotions that the psalmist is singing about in the problem. And then there's a turn in the psalm that leads us Godward, that leads us in faith. 
And so we need to learn to look for that turn. In this psalm, it is in verse 10. So let's look at the five verses of the song of the slandered together tonight. Let's look first at that petition for help. It's in the first two verses. Look down with me and read verse 1. O Yahweh, my God, in you I have taken refuge. Save me from all those who pursue me and deliver me. David calls out to Yahweh, his God. Again, Yahweh is that covenant name. It's built on the the basic verb to be. This indicates that God is the self-existing God. And this is the name God gave to his people Israel when he entered into covenant relationship with them on the basis of grace. You don't deserve to know me. You don't deserve to be my people, but I am who I am. And I'm going to make promises to you because I have set my love upon you. Every time you you see the name Yahweh, and in our English Bibles, this is often portrayed with the all capitals, L-O-R-D. In the Legacy Standard Bible, the the name Yahweh is written out for our help. But the idea is the self-existent, covenant-keeping God, the one whose relationship to his people is built on love and promise, is the one that David appeals to. And he says, O Yahweh, my God. In other words, his relationship to God is not abstract, it's not distant and theological, it is personal. He knows God the creator and sustainer of the universe. And God the creator and sustainer of the universe knows David. And on that basis, David makes an appeal. And he says, first of all, in you I have taken refuge. In other words, a completed action. David begins the psalm by saying... I find my refuge in God. He is my safety, which for a sinner to identify a holy God as his place of refuge and safety indicates David's banking on grace at the very beginning of the psalm. No sinner born in hostility to God could look to a holy God who is angry about sin as a refuge unless those sins are forgiven in covenant love. That is the foundation of the psalm right there in the first verse. And David cries out, save me, deliver me from those who pursue me. And this is an expression of faith. To call out to the only one who could help and ask for God to save or to rescue is a way to express trust in God. Listen, this is the basic language of prayer. If you could boil down prayer to one word, it is simply this, help I'm looking up to God, to the only one who can help, and I'm expressing my dependence upon him. Charles Spurgeon said, it is never right to distrust God, and it is never in vain to trust him. It would be sin for David not to trust God, and it is never without purpose. It is never without result for David to trust God. God is the only help. And so this expression of faith looks up to the only one who can truly help in the midst of difficulty. Look down at verse 2. Lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. Notice the word soul there. David is probably talking about the metaphysical rather than the physical. There may be real physical danger to David if what he's accused of is acted out upon by his enemies. But what David is concerned about here is his inner being. He's concerned about being shredded on the inside. And this is the effect of the words that his enemies have against him. I'm not sure if I should recommend to you the movie, The Ghost and the Darkness. It's terrifying. It is a movie about two lions in the heart of Africa in Savo that stopped the transcontinental railroad from progressing through that continent in the 1800s. The two lions that slaughtered many human beings who were working on that railroad are actually housed. Their their carcasses have been stuffed and they're in the museum in Chicago. You can go see the lions today. The, The movie is built on the true story. And it is a haunting story of these two lions who worked in pairs to kill humans, apparently for sport, collecting their bones in a cave as trophies. Like I said, you probably shouldn't watch it. 
There is a scene in the movie where a, a man is dragged out of a hospital tent by a ravenous lion and, and dragged through the thorny underbrush to be devoured in a far off place and his bones deposited as trophies. It, it's awful, but that is the scene that David depicts here. Save me, O Yahweh, lest my enemy tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces, and there's no one who can rescue me. Now, this is dramatic. And it is a scene that David, as a shepherd, had no doubt experienced. He had perhaps seen the effects of a lion's ravages on a sheep of the flock that had been left unattended. And a sheep would have been helpless before a lion, none to deliver, being dragged away to be devoured. That is the situation David is feeling from his enemies, his persecutors. I cannot imagine anything more terrifying than being dragged away and torn apart by a wild animal. That is why I have on my nightstand by my bed the book, Alaska Bear Tales. It is chapter after chapter after chapter of bear maulings in Alaska. And I read it for entertainment and so that I can't sleep at night. Again, I do not recommend it. It's a morbid way to try to conquer my own fears. This is dramatic imagery to describe the kind of pursuit that David is experiencing. And if it is the pursuit of Saul or Saul's loyalists who are accusing David of treasonous behavior against Saul, then those accusations come with the real threat of physical violence against him. In addition to the rending of his soul to pieces, David, if he is found to be treasonous against the throne could be very well in danger for his life too. David moves from a petition for help to an oath of innocence. Look down at verse 3. He says, O oh Yahweh my God, if I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands, and, and there is a series of ifs here, followed by the, the then, if I have done the things I'm being accused of, then let me face the consequences of those things. This, this section of the psalm comes in the form of an oath. It is a protest of his innocence in the thing he's being accused of. If these accusations are true, then let me suffer the consequences. I'm confident they're not true, so please rescue me from those who are accusing me. That is the force of these three verses. In verse 3, David's values are on display. If I have done this, if there is injustice in my hands. What does David value as his sort of code of conduct, as Derek Kidner called it? He, David values personal exercise of justice, of doing what is right. It, that comes out in the way he protests his own innocence here. He seems particularly stung by the accusations that, that he has done something unjust. The harassment that David is acutely perturbed by is not first and foremost the military threat, but the slander, the false accusation of injustice. You see, once the words are out, once the false accusations are out, they are nearly impossible to put back. The toothpaste is out of the tube, as it were. And the accusations are this, in verse 3, that David has committed some injustice. In verse 4, that he's done evil to the people that were supposed to be his friends. And in the second half of verse 4, that he has plundered, taken advantage of, or, or stolen from people, and thereby made enemies of them without cause. These accusations become rumors. The rumors spread like a forest fire to destroy David's character and his reputation. Charles Spurgeon said, once let an ill word get into men's mouths and it is not easy to get it fully out again. Once the idea would spread that David was treasonous against Saul, then the armies of Saul and the loyalists of Saul would be made enemies of David in greater and greater numbers. It's hard to undo that. Look down at verse 4. If I have rewarded evil to him who is at peace with me, or if I have plundered my adversary without cause. Again, these if statements, you, and you can hear what David valued. 
David actually valued his friendships. The, the one who is at peace with him, David had no cause for rewarding one with evil. Uh, David had no reason to make enemies against himself by stealing what didn't belong to him, by grasping after a position that wasn't rightly his. And when you read the account of David's dealings with Saul's, we watch with empathy. Uh, sorry, not plural Saul's, just one Saul. David protected Saul. David honored Saul, even while Saul tried to kill him. You see this as the backdrop for this song. You remember in the cave, Saul went to relieve himself. David was there with the ability to take him out, and instead he cut off the corner of his garment. And even in that, David felt the twinge of conscience over the dishonor rendered to God's anointed. Even that act where David spared Saul's life. And that wasn't the only time David, Saul, uh, David spared Saul's life. We see David's integrity before God. And that integrity was evident even to Saul himself. Saul on multiple occasions cried out, David, you are more righteous than I. Saul knew he was trying to kill David, and Saul knew that David had preserved Saul's life. It was certainly evident to Saul's son, Jonathan, who would have been in line for the throne, but became David's friend. David's motives, however, are maligned, and his character is slandered, and his trust in God is abused. Have you ever measured out David's trust in his situation with Saul? You can measure it in years, like 40 years. From the time that David knew he would be king, he waited 40 years for God to take care of the situation. That is a long time to wait on the Lord. And that was David's life. He didn't take matters into his own hands. He said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. He knew that as long as Saul was alive, he was alive at God's behest and he had been made king of Israel by the anointing through God's prophet. David would wait. David would trust. And so David speaks in these verses, 3, 4, and 5, generally. If I have done this, if there's injustice in my hands, if I rewarded evil, if I have plundered, then let the enemy pursue my soul. And I think these general statements sort of indicate not just the specifics of his dealings with Saul... But the pattern of integrity in his life that was characteristic of David. David has a clear conscience on this issue. He even led the nation in lamenting Saul's death, which was the occasion for his own ascension to the throne. David could have said, finally, okay, let's get on with it. <laughs> the king is dead, long live the new king. He didn't do any of that. He, he lamented Saul's death. Spurgeon said, Oh, it is a meanness most detestable to stab a good man in his reputation. But you know that diabolical hatred observes no nobility in its mode of warfare. So uh, Spurgeon is saying, all bets are off when you hate somebody. But how terrible it is to strike at a man's reputation. If it seems already in this sermon that I'm quoting Spurgeon a whole lot, it is for good reason. You're right, I will quote him more. <laughs> Spurgeon, in fact, titled Psalm 7, The Song of the Slandered Saint. And Charles Spurgeon, if you know anything about his life and ministry, he was a well-known and uncompromising preacher of the truth in a big city with a lot of detractors. He faced a lifetime of slanderous criticisms. Spurgeon's sermons were in the newspapers and they were critiqued every week for all of London to read. He faced criticisms from outsiders, criticisms from people close to him, criticisms from people that were in his church. He experienced the rejection of his own denomination. His church was completely removed from the group. He knew this psalm, and he evidently relied on its expressions of faith in the midst of being slandered. Charles Spurgeon knew what it was like to trust God in a situation like David's. Now look at verse 5. David says, if I've done this, if I've done this, if I've done this, then let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life down to the ground and cause my glory to dwell in the dust. 
David is saying, let this go to the extremes. Let me be killed. Let me die. Now, I know this is in the songbook of Israel. This is what the people of God are supposed to sing. And, and yet, I don't think I would commend to you David's example here in casting an oath. Our flesh tends to make rash protestations of our own innocence and integrity. When often our motives are mixed and we don't have all the information. In David's case, if the Benjamite clan upset that Saul is being displaced is the circumstance in the backdrop of this psalm, then we actually have God's assessment of the situation available for us to examine. God's narrator records David's integrity for us in his dealings with Saul. Then we have God's assessment of the situation and we can trust God's assessment. And, and you know that in the biblical narrative, David's character is not whitewashed. And that is so counterintuitive in ancient literature. The ancient Near Eastern pattern was to exalt the kings to whitewash their character and never record their errors. In fact, you can go to the British Museum and you can read the records of the Assyrian Empire and the Egyptians and the Babylonians. And do you know what they never record? Losses in battle, moral failures of their kings, uh, anything that discredits their character. The writings of the ancient Near East universally exalt their kings, exalt their monarchs, and whitewash any flaws. This is one of the things that sets the Bible apart from all literature in the ancient world. The Bible does not do that. The Bible does not portray its leaders like the, the, to the victor goes the spoils, to, to the winner goes the writing of history. No, God, the flawless narrator, tells us the truth about our heroes. The Bible is not a book of human heroes whose lives are to be followed because they were so great. The whole story of the Bible is even the best among us are sinners who must be saved by grace if there is any hope for a story. So you know David's life is not whitewashed in the Bible. God's narrator is not shy at all about David's lapses of integrity or his failures of faith. Think about Bathsheba and Uriah recorded in their details. David's sinful census or David's bad dealings with his sons. His sinful favoritism and enablement of Absalom. David did not make appeal to his own character or integrity in those cases. But in this case... David's character is upheld by the biblical record. Now, you and I don't often have the luxury of such clarity on our own lives. We are biased. We don't see straight. We tend to give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We think the worst of others. We think the best of ourselves. An oath like this, I think, would be dangerous for us. To, to try to tell other people, look, if I've really done the thing you think I did, then let lightning hit me now. Let me fall down dead. See, I didn't fall down dead, so you have to trust me. <laughs> Our flesh loves to do that kind of thing. I would not suggest you call down curses on yourself as a test or proof of your integrity. And you certainly should not make oaths like this to try to prove to others that you are in the right. In fact, I believe such protests often reveal that you're hiding foul motives and covering up lapses of integrity. Let me suggest to you a, another principle. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, Paul the Apostle was one who defended his ministry as an apostle, as an official spokesman for God and for the gospel. There was a place for him to defend his integrity, defend his motives. But listen to the way he does this. There's a little window into Paul's heart in this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Let a man consider us, Paul and his associates, in this manner. As servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. I don't belong to myself. I belong to Jesus. I have a responsibility with the message. In this case, he says, it is required of stewards that one be found faithful. Okay, high calling. Uh, Paul's going to be an apostle. He's got a serious, sober stewardship with the apostolic message. He better be faithful with it. 
as a servant of Christ. And he says in verse 3, But to me it is a very small thing that I may be examined by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even examine myself. For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not by this acquitted. The one who examines me is the Lord. Here's Paul's own view of himself. I, I'm not aware of, of any way that my conscience is violated by what I've been doing. And, and, and if I have accusers, I should expect that I would have accusers. If I'm a steward of the gospel, it is naturally offensive and scandalous to the world around me. Of course, people are going to think ill of a messenger of the gospel, especially one as high profile as the apostle Paul. And so at one level, it doesn't matter what people think about me. I don't even like to think about myself along these lines, but I'm not conscious of anything that displeases the Lord. And he says, but yet even in this, I'm not acquitted. Here, here's the little caveat on, on Paul's own self-perspective. I'm not aware of any sin, but that doesn't mean I don't have mixed motives. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm clean and pure. I will have to trust the Lord for these things. And then he says, verse 5, here's the principle for all of us. Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring both to light the things hidden in the darkness and will make manifest the motives of hearts. And then each one's praise will come from God. So I, I don't think David's wrong in asserting what he's asserting here. He has the full authority of God's assessment of his life and integrity to do it. However, as we think about that, I think it's helpful for us to remember our own bias and to be careful with such things. This section ends with a Selah. Do you see that at the end of verse 5? That's the musical pause. That's the cello solo or the piano interlude. That's where the instruments carry us along while we sit in this thought just a little while. And, and what is the thought that we're sitting in? This plea from David that if he had done injustice that he would come to his own end. After the pause, David moves from that oath of innocence to a request for justice. This begins in verse 6. You need to understand when the, that when David cries out for justice, for God to do what is right, to, to uphold the standards of, of right and wrong in David's life, you have to remember that David's troubles are a personal crisis. That's true. This is very personal and emotional in this psalm. But David's troubles are not just a personal crisis. They are also a national crisis. David, as the, the king of Israel, as the one who is anointed to be king over Israel, as the, as the one who's been promised by God to be the placeholder for his promises, David's troubles are a national crisis and a covenant crisis. If things go well for David, they will go well for the nation. And if God doesn't keep his promise to David, then his covenant promises to the nation, to David's descendants, involving a Messiah through the line of David, fall apart. So the stakes here are very high. David appeals to all of that and he says, Yahweh arise. My enemies have risen up. God, you arise. And when he says in verse 6, God, you judge, arise, O Yahweh, in your anger, lift up yourself against the fury of my adversaries, arouse yourself for me, you have appointed judgment, or, or you have set apart justice. All of this is a request to God, the true arbiter of justice. This is the opposite of vengeance is mine, saith David. Uh, this is an appeal to God, a request for God to do what is right. Again, Spurgeon said, if we would live without being slandered, we must wait until we get to heaven. Let us be very mindful not to believe the flying rumors, which are always harassing gracious men. If there were no believers in lies, there would be no market for falsehood and good men's characters would be safe. We're not in heaven yet. There is a market for lies, so just be prepared. Uh, that's a good perspective to let them sit in their place. 
to trust God, to, to rely on God as the final arbiter of justice. And look at verse 7. David prays, let the congregation of the peoples encompass you, surround you, and over them return on high. David here involves the entire congregation of the nation of Israel to join him in this appeal. Again, if David is helped, the nation is helped. The covenant is secured. And the purpose of having David's prayer enter the songbook is for all the nation to sing it. All of God's people were to be singing these words. And when he says, over them return on high, he is asking God to let the people of God sing to him, to ask his help, await his justice, and for God to return over them. In other words, we can all rest when God has rendered the verdict. Our rest is in God doing what is right. Look at verse 8. Yahweh judges the peoples should be translated Yahweh will judge the peoples. This is an, an unfinished verb. It, it looks to the future. Yahweh, the, the covenant-keeping, self-existent God of Israel, will judge the peoples, just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4. This is a future reality. It's not settled yet. This, again, is another aspect of waiting on the Lord. It is faith multiplied by time. And David makes the appeal. He says, according to my righteousness and integrity. David's appeal here to his righteousness and to his integrity is not to categories of absolute holiness, absolute righteousness. Uh, no human could ever make such a claim. But David is innocent in the matter of which he's accused by his slanderers. It is possible to be innocent in a thing and not be innocent absolutely. That is David's ground of prayer here. He's innocent in the matter of which he's accused. And remember back in verse 1, he, he appealed to God on the basis of having taken refuge in God. Again, an appeal on the fundamental basis of grace. Uh, not something that, that someone does in their self-righteousness. David could hardly take refuge in God if there was unrepentant sin that left him in a hostile and faithless relationship to a holy God. When we come to verse 9, we read this. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. For the righteous God tests the hearts and the minds. As we have seen in nearly all of the Psalms up to this point, the, the wicked and the righteous are contrasted. And, and those are categorical statements. Uh, we're not talking about people who are sinless versus people who are sinful. We are talking about the, the sinners who are counted righteous precisely because they've taken refuge in God by His grace. Over and against the wicked who will not take refuge in God and will not have forgiveness for their sins. And this is a prayer that we all pray. If we're following our Lord's example when He gave the disciples a model for prayer, He said, pray this way, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a prayer for the end of all evil. That is a prayer for righteousness to fill the earth, even as righteousness fills the halls of heaven. This is the prayer by which we cry out, How long, O Lord? How long will you wait to set everything right? This is a future hope for the cessation of evil. This eschatology here will be fulfilled in the rule of Messiah. Look back at verse 9 again. Let the evil of the wicked come to an end, but establish the righteous. Like so many of the anticipations in the Psalms, those anticipations will, be not, will not be met with fulfillment until the millennial kingdom and or the new heavens and the new earth to come. David gives a, a reason for this appeal. For the righteous God tests the hearts and minds. Literally tests the hearts and the kidneys. That is the, the innermost parts. God, God sees straight through. We can await the final judgment when the God who tests every heart. There is no secret motive that escapes the judgment of Jesus. There is no uh, secret motive that escapes the scrutiny of God the judge. He is righteous in his judgment. That is, he will do what is right. And we must know that God is righteous whether he judges 
in condemnation of unforgiven sinners, or he judges in the justification of forgiven sinners. Remember in that great explanation of the gospel in in Romans chapter 3, Paul says that God set forth his son Jesus as a propitiation through faith in his blood so that God would be just and the justifier of those who believe. In other words, God made his son be a substitute sacrifice to take away God's own wrath against our sins if we will believe. If you believe that Jesus paid for your sins, God looks on that faith as righteousness. And when he does that, when he declares the sinner righteous on the basis of faith, he is just to forgive. And he is also just to condemn those who do not place their faith in Christ. There is no double jeopardy with God. If, if God forgives your sin at the infinite cost of his son in your place, then there's no more sin to punish. And so he is just. And if you do not turn from your sin, God is just to condemn you for it forever. David's appeal here is to a righteous God who tries the hearts. Grace for those who take refuge. Judgment for those who do not. David then moves from this request for justice to a profession of faith. And this is where we see the turn here in verse 10. Again, we will keep learning to look for the turn in the Psalms. A turn from anxiety to faith, from perplexity to confidence, from temporal thinking to eschatological hope. Over the course of the song, the the situation most often doesn't change. David's situation doesn't change in this song. But David's heart changes right here in the turn in verse 10. This is why we need the Psalms. The hardships, the broken hearts, the sorrow over sin, the oppression of enemies. All of the poetic descriptions of these things set to music. They meet us where we are. But the turn takes us where we need to be. Look at verse 10. Theological declarations of truths about God. My shield is with God. He saves the upright in heart. This is an affirmation of faith. God hears and he saves. When he says my shield is with God. He means my defense belongs to God. God has taken up the task of my my protection. It's his. The ball's in his court. For my defense. Look at verse 11. The first half. God is a righteous judge. That is truth wins. God cannot fail. In the end. To do what is right. David's trust that God will judge. Induces David. Now to warn the wicked of coming judgment. Look at the second half of verse 11. He is a God who has. Indignation every day. This is a comfort for believers and a warning to unbelievers. God is not indifferent. Therefore, we can pray with confidence that God will do what is right. And we can wait with confident expectation. God is, in fact, angry at ongoing rebellion. In fact, God is more angry about sin than we could ever be. God's anger over sin exceeds infinitely our fear of sinners. Our anxiety over things not right. God is more offended when his children are slandered than his children could ever be offended. God is angry at sin every day, this text tells us. You have to know something about God's anger. It is holy anger, like all of his attributes are holy. That is, it is sinless. God does not react to sin recklessly. He doesn't fly off the handle out of control, making matters worse by capricious venting or disproportionate reaction. God's anger against sin is holy. It is resolute. It is good and settled and appropriate. It is controlled in his own holiness. And so this part of the song is a comfort to believers under the oppression of evil men. And it is a warning to unbelief. Look at verse 12. If a man does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and prepared it. He has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He makes his arrows fiery shafts. 
we might say in our day that God has his finger on a loaded weapon, on the trigger of a loaded gun. The bowstring is pulled, the arrow is aimed. In fact, the arrows have been dipped in oil or pitch or, or some sort of flammable material so that, so that they are on fire as they uh, will be launched. This is a graphic depiction of the precarious position of unbelief. If you were holding out against God, if you were here tonight, if you're, if you're listening to this psalm and you're saying, I don't want to surrender to God. I don't want him to be in charge of my life. I don't really want to believe in Jesus right now. You have to understand that the bowstring is already taught. The arrows are loaded and aimed. And you must be very careful about resisting God's mercy in a time when grace can be found. There is no guarantee for you of another heartbeat. Charles Spurgeon said, sinners may have many feast days, but they have no safe days. There is more danger than you are aware. Listen, as long as you are breathing God's air and, and your heart is beating on borrowed time, you are under his mercy. You're not getting what you actually deserve. And you have the opportunity to experience his grace. God makes this invitation, even through the warning of David in this psalm, with a, with a bent bow and fiery arrows pointed at your very heart. There is an implicit invitation to turn, find refuge in a holy God, and find grace for salvation. And my invitation to you is, is exactly that. If you don't know the Lord, turn, turn to him and find forgiveness and life in Christ. God's reserves of mercy will eventually run out. And he has been generous with you up to this point. There's another aspect of the danger of sin. We find it in verses 14 and 15. Here, the subject is not God. Notice in your English translation, lowercase he, that David's been talking about God, but now he changes the subject and he's talking about the sinner. He said, behold, he, the sinner, travails with wickedness. Uh, this is the word for a, a woman with child. And he conceives mischief and he gives birth to falsehood. This is another graphic, poetic depiction of sin. Like a woman with child, a, a, an evil man is, is filled with evil intent. And he labors to bring that into the world, into the light of day. And, and notice what happens in verse 15. He digs a pit and he hollows it out and he falls into the hole that he made. His mischief returns on his own head. His violence depends or descends upon his own skull. This is, this is more than a, a sowing and reaping picture. You know the idea of sowing. If, if you sow seeds, you'll, you'll reap the consequences of what you sowed. This starts with the evil intent. You're here you're sowing seeds of destruction against others and those very destructions come back upon your own head. This is the, you know, the picture that was in the news recently of the arsonist who was trying to set fire to, to someone's house and he set himself on fire, blew up his own car and, and went to the hospital with burns. That is the picture here. You, you fire an arrow up into the air hoping to hit your enemy and it comes back down upon you. You, you dig a hole and, and, and cover it over secretly and, and at the bottom of that hole are, 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 are shaved out, carved out wooden spikes de designed to impale your enemy. And you forget where that is and you fall through the trap door yourself. That is the picture described here. The, the, most, the most dramatic victim of his own perpetrations of evil is Satan himself. You think about the murderer of humanity who will be most accountable for all of his crimes of deception and intrigue and hatred of God and hatred of the image bearers of God. What will he face in eternity? All those things he designed against God's people coming back on himself, on his own person forever. And all of those who have followed him into judgment before a holy God will face the consequences of their own 
sin. Finally, David moves from that profession of faith to an expression of thanks. Read verse 17. I will give thanks to Yahweh according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of Yahweh most high. And the psalm begins with a situation of slander that has David crying out for help. It moves to the turn of faith in verse 10, and it concludes in verse 17 with joy and with gratitude. We move from the slandering or the, those suffering under slander to those joyfully singing. And listen, in verse 17, we discover that God's people love the righteousness of God. That's only possible in the gospel. You remember Martin Luther's life? Before he knew the saving grace of God in Christ and the gospel, he said, I hated the righteousness of God. He said he would read about it in the Bible. He would hear about it. He would read it in Romans 3. And he said, I don't get it. I hate it. It is my enemy. Why? Because the righteousness of God is this impenetrable standard that haunts my burdened conscience. I could never meet that perfect standard. And it was not until he understood the doctrine of imputed righteousness, the gift of an alien righteousness, not his own, But the gift of righteousness in Christ purchased for him at the cross, credited to his account on the basis of faith that Luther could say the righteousness of God is a good thing. And here at the conclusion of this psalm, David is leading the people of God to say, according to your righteousness of God, oh God, we love you. We express our joy and our thanksgiving to you. And we sing your praises. Listen, the the, the unbelievers who try to get to God by their own righteousness, could never sing praise to Yahweh on the basis of his righteousness. God's righteousness is only a threat to the self-righteous. Here, God's people sing. And the song closes with the name of Yahweh Most High. To talk about God's name is is to talk about who he really is. Names are are sometimes throwaways for us, but in the Bible, names are embedded with character and attributes, and, and particularly the names of God are so important. The first place we come across this name of Yahweh Most High, El Elyon, God above all. The first time we come across that is Abraham's dealing with Melchizedek. And to know that, that God most high, the, the God above all so-called gods, the God above all human strength, the God above all of our enemies and all of our oppressors is the source of our hope, the source of our confidence, and here the object of our praise. He's the biggest and the strongest. Turn to Acts 5.41 as we close this evening. If you've ever been mistreated anywhere near the the way David has been mistreated here or or the Apostle Paul has been mistreated, you you must know you are in good company. We talked about it this morning. All who desire to be godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you affiliate yourself with the name of Jesus or, or with the righteousness of God or with the grace of God in the gospel... Someday, somehow, you will be maligned with words. Look at Acts 5.41. These are the disciples, the the apostles who, who were beaten for trying to tell people that God loves them through Christ. You can't get a sweeter message than what they preached. And they were taken in and beaten Verse 41 of Acts 5, they went on their way from the presence of the Sanhedrin rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for the name. David closes Psalm 7 with rejoicing in the name of Yahweh most high after being attacked by words. And here in Acts 541, the apostles preaching the love of God to people who needed to hear it were attacked, physically beaten, And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to take shame for the name that they loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We don't love you as you deserve. We believe you, and yet we cry for help 
in our unbelief. We empathize with David. We, we see how he behaved towards Saul and then how he was mistreated by Saul. Should we ever encounter something like that, O oh God, we pray to have the faith of David to trust in the end, to trust a righteous judge, to leave our case in your court and to do what is right. These are hard things that we know that words can be hurtful and harmful, and yet you know them all. And we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen.